From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Regular listeners of Inside the Ice House will note the several times we've brought you inside special events happening in and around the Intercontinental Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the NYSC was the locus of headline-making events of all stripes, with audiences arrayed in our boardroom and other spaces at 11 Wall Street that touched on different issues across the economic spectrum. One of those events was a discussion with ICE founder and CEO Jeff Sprecher, who's live from Abu Dhabi on the past, present, and future of the oil markets. That talk was hosted by Halima Croft, the managing director and global head of commodity strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Well, times have changed somewhat, and events have moved for the present online, but are no less timely and newsworthy. And today we turn the questioning on the questioner. The aforementioned Ms. Croft, what you're about to hear was recorded live in front of a virtual audience as part of our ongoing series of events hosted by Intercontinental Exchange, bringing our customers, partners, and others the latest information and perspectives on what they should be looking at in the markets. The interviewer this time is our own Stacey Cunningham, president of the New York Stock Exchange, sitting down virtually with Halima to discuss this unprecedented time in energy. It was a fascinating and far-ranging conversation covering the latest OPEC Plus headlines, supply and demand dynamics, and the economic impact of the upcoming U.S. elections and continuing COVID-19 pandemic, all that, their effect on the marketplace itself. After the break, the next voice you hear will be Stacey Cunningham's introducing Halima Croft. Take it away, Stacey. Historical data can offer insight into the direction of markets. Yet data processing, collection, and storage can be challenging and costly. To simplify your data access needs and help find efficiencies, we launched ICE Data Vault, a cloud-based platform that enables you to access tick history for global exchanges, as well as our proprietary data, sourced from our real-time feed. Backtest your trading strategies to assess performance and viability conduct transaction cost analysis, and support compliance requirements. Input data into surveillance systems to help detect and prevent abusive or illegal trading activities. Access over 10 years of deep tick history across asset classes. Get tick data for an entire market or on an underlying list of instruments. Access additional securities as needed with flexible delivery options to complement your workflow. Simplify your historical data management with ICE Data Vault. This is Stacey Cunningham. I'm president of the New York Stock Exchange. And I just want to thank uh, all of our customers across NYC and Intercontinental Exchange for joining us in another session of our All Access Conversations. I'm pleased to welcome Halima Croft today, Managing Director and Global Head of Commodity Strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Halima is going to help us unpack the current state of the energy markets. Halima has a deep background uh, of commodities and geopolitical experience, having previously worked for the CIA and Council on Foreign Relations, as well as leading North American commodities research at Barclays. Along with her team at RBC, she is the authoritative voice on geopolitics and energy, spending considerable time throughout the year in the Middle East and at OPEC. Halima, we're thrilled to have you join us. Thank you so much for having me today. All right, so let's just to kick us off, let's go back to March of this year, which frankly sounds like more than a year ago. You were in Saudi after the March 6th meeting fall off that led to the start of the oil price crash in 2020. Tell us what that was like. Actually, I'm going to back it up to the beginning of the year. I mean, it was so interesting. Which feels like two years ago. (laughs) Feels like two years ago. How we started this year, I remember in January, we started getting the reports about this virus in Wuhan. You know, immediately people in the market were starting to think about what would the demand impact look like? 
Would it be something like SARS? Would it be more transitory? And it was interesting to watch how sort of OPEC plus, this union that came together in November of 2016 with Russia and Saudi Arabia at the helm, reacted to the reports of this potentially global health crisis. The Saudis very much saw it through the lens of the sort of 08, 09 financial crisis, and they wanted to do a big cut immediately. They were looking to do a big cut, you know, in February to signal to the market that they were prepared to act and get ahead of the situation. The Russians, on the other hand, wanted to take a more wait and see approach, wait for the real demand numbers to come in. And they were also growing increasingly tired of cutting production and essentially propping up U.S. production. And you had a very, very powerful CEO in Russia, Igor Sechin. He comes out of the intelligence services. People say he's probably the most second most powerful man in Russia, very close to Vladimir Putin. And his position was, we cut, the U.S. grows, and we get sanctioned. And in December of 2019, the U.S. had imposed new sanctions to prevent the completion of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project, we had sanctioned in January Rosneft trading, and that really gave strength to Sechin's argument in Russia, in the power circles, that this OPEC plus arrangement was not necessarily in Russia's best interest. So we fast forward to the March 6th OPEC meeting, decision day, and I was actually there in Vienna. And we had had reports all week that the Russians were not looking to do an additional cut. They were essentially saying, look, Saudi Arabia, the rest of OPEC, if you want to cut more, that's fine. But we're tired of doing this. And I think a lot of market participants like myself in Vienna just didn't believe it could possibly fall apart. We thought it was in everyone's interest to basically do what the Saudis wanted and to do an additional big cut. And I think many of us were caught off guard by the fact that the Russians essentially just said, no, we're not doing it. And then the Saudi response was really, really dramatic. I remember being outside the OPEC secretariat that Friday night, and the Saudi oil minister, His Royal Highness Prince Abdelaziz, sort of leaves the building, and he's asked by reporters, what's next? And he essentially says, just wait and see. And so when we landed in Riyadh, because they were having G20 energy security meeting over the weekend, when we landed in Saudi, when we had gotten off the plane, the Saudis had dramatically slashed their official selling prices. And that was the signal to the market that essentially it was game on. And it was really interesting to be in Riyadh that weekend with the discussions about why the Saudis were looking to do this. And it was, it was different than 2014, November, when they essentially said, we're not going to put a floor in and we're going to shift the burden of adjustment to the U.S. producers. What the Saudis said they were looking to do was essentially drive the Russians back to the negotiating table. The Saudi position has been, we will cut, but everybody better cut with us. We're tired of free riding. And so we're going to drag the Russians back to the table. And a lot of people, myself included, were looking at the Saudi fiscal break-evens and saying, wow, you know, you have really significant domestic spending commitments. Are you really prepared financially to deal with low oil prices? And we were told that, look, the Saudis are prepared to borrow. They're willing to see this through. And then we had, you know, the Saudi production numbers go through the roof. You had everybody essentially saying within OPEC, we're going to max out production in the midst of the worst demand crash we'd ever seen. And the rest is history in terms of what happened with prices. But it was just so interesting to see that up close. And just to see how a dispute over cutting 300,000 barrels a day would lead to this price war that had really serious implications. And then fast forward just one month, you know, we have this huge OPEC plus cut. And, and you know, why is this one so important? You know, there, there are some unique aspects of it. So t talk to us a little bit about the cut. You know, I think what was really interesting when we think about the cut that was done in April, you know, the role that the U.S. administration had played in the cut. Mm -hmm. So right when the price war began, you know, President Trump, I think, didn't know necessarily whether the crash in prices was a good thing or a bad thing. And so initially, when asked about it, I think he saw it through the lens of the U.S. consumer. And if you think about President Trump, President Trump spent the first three years in office being highly critical of OPEC calling it a cartel, basically threatening to sign legislation that's been working its way through the Hill for years called NOPEC, which would declare OPEC a cartel and subject it to certain type of German antitrust legislation, basically said, break it out. 
And he had been tweeting a lot for the past, you know, three years in office saying low prices were great for the consumer, get prices lower. He had called on Saudi Arabia directly in the summer of 2018 after the U.S. had exited the nuclear deal to essentially put a million extra barrels on the market. And so he was somebody who'd really talked about low prices being great for the U.S. consumer. So initially, I think he saw it through the lens of this is necessarily not necessarily a bad thing. But then when you had the scale of the collapse become apparent, when you had storage starting to fill up, and then when you had U.S. oil and gas producers, you know, stalwart supporters of this administration say, this is a terrible outcome for us. Then President Trump sort of shifted gears and became a sort of champion of collective action to stabilize the markets. And he became very involved and his team became very involved in brokering an agreement, getting the Russians back to the table, getting the Saudis back to the table, you know, getting the U.S., to participate in negotiations. And obviously the U.S. oil industry is very different than these sovereign producer countries, but getting the U.S. is part of the conversation. And then at the 11th hour, when Mexico looked like they were not gonna participate because Lopez Obrador had basically run a platform of making Pemex great again in Mexico. And he was like, look, I have a hedge in place. <laughs> I'm totally fine dealing with this low oil price environment. Not fine, but a better place because of this hedging mechanism. He didn't want to take a 400,000 barrel a day cut. And so Donald Trump had to make the call to do a workaround arrangement to get this deal across the finish line. And then you had participation with other countries, not formal cooperation, but obviously U.S. production has come down significantly. Norway, other producers, Brazil. And that was done through the G20 framework to have a sort of discussion about what the whole global production landscape was going to look like. But it did require significant U.S. participation and a coordinating role. So I think when we talk about why this cut was historic, I think it was historic because of the magnitude of it, but also because I think it was the first time the U.S. president acted as a de facto president of OPEC. So, so you use the term first time. Is it the first time or is this a one off because of the unique nature of the, of the situation? Do you, do you think it's just because we were in the middle of a historic price collapse and, and dealing with the pandemic and, and demand was so low? Or, or do you think this is the beginning of a new norm and the start of a more permanent change? Is the U.S. going to cooperate with OPEC plus uh, more regularly? I think that is a great question, because in the past, the U.S. has made calls to Saudi Arabia. I mean, we have made calls on a number of occasions when prices are too high to ask the Saudis to help us. We've called mm -hmm. them, for example, during the Gulf War to ask them to help us. We called them, you know, in 2011 when we had the Arab Spring and we lost significant quantities of production out of Libya. We called them to help with that situation. As I mentioned, you know, President Trump called Mohammed bin Salman in the summer of 2018 after the U.S. had exited the Iranian mm -hmm. nuclear deal and signaled real intent to take you know, millions of Iranian exports off the market. You know, we called the Saudis then and asked them to help us. So we've always done it on a bilateral basis. It's usually the first time I think that we decided to work with OPEC. So we just have to wait and see, you know, what the market brings in terms of either how a second Trump administration would look at working with OPEC or a potentially incoming Biden administration. Yeah. And, and I wonder how welcome that would be by OPEC plus to have the U.S. more involved in directly in those conversations. I mean, what are you hearing? Well, I think that's really interesting because I think that, you know, in the past you've had, you know, OPEC officials. So, for example, Secretary General, you know, Mohammed Sanusi Barbindo, a lot of these guys are educated in the United States. They have a very good view of the United States. And so I actually think that they thought it was very helpful to have U.S. engagement in this crisis. I mean, certainly, I think the U.S. played the marriage counselor role, and I think they think it was very helpful that the U.S. could use the weight of its position to, again, like, get the Russians back to the table, get the Mexicans and the Saudis to, like, resolve the dispute over 400,000 barrels. So I think that they were very appreciative of the U.S. role, and I also think they're appreciative of what they believe is a growing view that sort of everybody's in it together. When we think about the American energy revolution, I think all too often we told it only through the lens of like U.S. ingenuity, you know, the great story about, you know, the, the U.S., you know, frackers, you know, our uniqueness of our legal structure, our land tenure structure. But also there was this sort of fundamental economic assist 
that was coming from OPEC since 2016. You know, there had been a financial lifeline provided by the sovereign producers to our U.S. producers. I mean, what about the Saudis and the Russians? How do you see their relationship going forward in finding that balance and supporting their own prices and also you know, trying to keep market share from a possibly resurgent U.S.? I mean, this is such a great story about the sort of, I think there's so many stories that can be written about how shale has fundamentally changed, not just energy markets, but global geopolitics. Mm -hmm. If you think about the Cold War, I mean, the U.S. and the Saudis were such a strong Cold War partnership. I mean, many people think about the fall of the Soviet Union. We tie it to what happened in Afghanistan. Obviously, the Saudis were a big backer of the U.S. and the Afghan operation. But also, you know, oil prices collapsed. And, you know, there is a view that the collapse of oil prices helped hasten the decline of the Soviet Union. And the Saudis mm -hmm. had played a role in that oil price collapse that helped bring the Soviet Union you know, to its knees. And so there's always been this sort of tough relationship that people thought couldn't sustain an OPEC marriage. They looked at 2016 and they said, this is really a shotgun marriage driven by shale. You know, is it going to be very temporary? And one thing that I think that the Russians have been very, very good at doing is I think they've been very good at looking around the world and saying, like, where are these political vacuums by maybe the U.S. pulling back and where can we fill them? And I think the Russians were very good in basically saying we're now in OPEC 2016 forward. Let's see what we can do in terms of like expanding our global influence. And I do think what we saw was we saw a bunch of trade deals that were signed, for example, mm -hmm. between you know Saudi Arabia, Russia, UAE, Russia, a whole host of countries. We saw sort of expanding Russian influence in places like Libya, in you know Venezuela. We talk about will Maduro stay or will Maduro go? I think it's largely mm -hmm. a question of like, what is the Russian lifeline going to be? I mean, in some respects, I would say that Russia has now displaced China as the most important bilateral partner of the Venezuelan regime. And so I actually think that the Russians gained a lot in terms of side trade deals and in terms of soft power by being part of this arrangement. I mean, I go back to 2013, I was at the OPEC seminar and this is, I'm sorry, this was um, 2016, sorry. Um, <laughs> it was actually, you know, right when we had this sort of price collapse. And I remember like Alexander Novak, when prices had collapsed and was asked, you know, will you work with OPEC since 2015? And he said, no, we'll never work with OPEC. And I question its relevance in the face of, you know, U.S. production. For the Russians to have gone from saying, we question the relevance of OPEC, when the prices were, you know, after the price collapse of 2014, 2015, to now essentially co-managing this organization. I mean, the fact that you have Alexander Novak, the Russian oil minister, sitting with the Saudi oil minister as co-chairs of this big, super sovereign producer group. I think, again, I think the Russians gain in terms of soft power from this. But there are others within the Russian energy landscape. Again, I mentioned Igor Sechin who never wanted to be part of this agreement. I mean, Sachin, you know, has always been a critic of this. And his big energy behemoth, Rofsnes, the most important Russian energy company, I mean, they are the ones that have the ties to companies, you know, in Venezuela. I mean, they are the ones who were really subject to U.S. sanction. And again, from his standpoint, he looked at it and said, we're part of this arrangement. We keep shutting down barrels, and yet our companies are getting sanctioned. Like, why should we keep American energy dominance going? And so I think that is a really important thing to think about, sort of what was the U.S. foreign policy gains that we made because of the U.S. resource endowment? And I remember being in Washington when the Trump administration came into office, and they really talked about not just American energy independence, which is something that you would hear a bit under the Obama administration, this was really dominance. I remember listening to Trump administration officials early on say the goal should be to get every U.S. barrel we can out of the ground, get it on the water, you know, upgrade our midstream infrastructure, because what that gives us is it gives us the ability to sanction our adversaries. And the fact that you could sanction a country without paying a price domestically, that oil prices wouldn't rise if you took millions of barrels of Iranian exports off the market, if you did an embargo on Venezuelan barrels coming to the United States, which we did, and U.S. consumers would be shielded from the effects of that because of sanctions. It gave us, they believed, a much freer hand 
to really challenge our adversaries in a way we never would have before because we were too concerned about hurting the U.S. consumer. And so if you're sitting in Moscow and you're hearing this rhetoric and then you're seeing what was unfolding, again, I mentioned Nord Stream 2. It's an incredibly important gas pipeline project for the Russians. And for us to basically try to block it once again, when it was 94% completed, and then again, sanction Rosneft for doing business with Venezuela. From the standpoint of someone like Sachin, you know, that was like, this, this just isn't working for us. So I think about the marriage between Russia and OPEC. I think that in a rising price environment, it becomes potentially strained. And I think, again, if you have more U.S. sanctions put on these companies, someone like a Sachin might become more emboldened again. Her arguments may become more powerful. I think it was a twin thing that happened that made such an powerful was rising U.S. production and it was further sanctions efforts against Russian corporates. It's hard to look at 2020 and not think that we are going to have a total sea change, right? That there's there's going to be a, a real shift in the landscape. And when you look at prior events, 9-11 being one of them, like, what do you see going forward? Well, I think what is so interesting is, you know, you bring up 9-11. And I began my career, you know, working in the U.S. intelligence community as a a CIA analyst. I joined out of doing a PhD at Princeton, like right after 9-11. Vice President Cheney came with an energy industry background from being at Halliburton. And the moment we were in was the idea of energy dependence and the idea that U.S. national security came through you know, having multiple supplies of energy, not having concentration risk in one region, because we didn't have the U.S. resource endowment. U.S. production was declining at the time. And so we were very focused on, can we secure additional supply out of West Africa? We were very focused on getting additional barrels in from a place like Nigeria. Can we get barrels from the stands? Can we make sure we're not so dependent on the Middle East? And I think it did impact our foreign policy. We're very focused on not doing anything that could disrupt global energy flows. And if we were going to take action that would do so, I'm thinking of the Iraq war, we were very focused on if we're going to lose Iraqi barrels, can we make sure that we can have barrels coming in from other places? So I remember as a CIA analyst, we were very focused on like Nigerian supply disruptions in 2003 because we were going into this conflict with Iraq and we were expecting to lose those Iraqi barrels. We were very concerned about the Venezuelan oil strike in 2003 because, again, we thought we needed those barrels. It was a position of dependency. And I think about 2019 in particular, that was such a seismic year for me because I kept being in the Middle East when things that were happening, which I thought would have exploded oil markets before. Like I was landing in Abu Dhabi in May. And as we were touching down, we got reports across the screen that four tankers had been hit off the coast of UAE. And the Iranians had just made, you know, comments days before that there could be planned accidents around strategic waterways because we were trying to take off so many of their exports off the market. And I thought, wow, if you had told me that we were going to have tanker attacks in the Straits of Hormuz linked to Iran, you'd be talking about potential U.S. military action. I mean, we have had a doctrine in place called the Carter Doctrine since 1980 that says that Gulf energy assets, protecting them is a strategic priority of the United States. And so the fact that we had those tanker attacks, followed by attacks on Saudi's east-west pipeline, further drone attacks, and then on September 14th, to have cruise missiles and drones take more than half of Saudi Arabia's energy production offline. I mean, they hit the nerve center of the global energy system, what we thought was the nerve center, the Abcake facility, the world's largest oil processing facility. To have had that hit in an attack linked to a sovereign state and A, not have any formal U.S. military response, but also to have very limited price response. To me, that was really sort of a a really interesting seismic shift in terms of the geopolitics. And so I think as we think into 2020, and now we've had sort of a depressed oil price environment, I think there are interesting questions about, do we see more instability in key producer states, in countries that just don't have the ability to balance their budgets and pay their security services in this price environment? So we're looking at potential more instability across the sort of 
sovereign oil producer landscape? And what is the sort of U.S. response going to be? So I think it'll be very interesting to see if we're in this sort of 40 to 45 dollar range, what's the political landscape going to be around the world? And what is the U.S. sort of desire to become involved in sort of stabilizing crises? Since you mentioned this, I'll, I just want to reference you were quoted this morning in the Wall Street Journal suggesting that Russia's claim of $42 a barrel to meet their budget requirements is more like $65. As the price of oil increases, it, it will it be harder for Russia and the Saudis to agree or comply to cuts? Well, I think, you know, that's really interesting because the Russians, you know, they very much, you know, say publicly we have a much lower break even than the rest of the OPEC producers. And certainly they do. And they certainly mm -hmm. have this, like exchange rate flexibility. I mean, ruble depreciation was one of the key ways that they were able to weather the price collapse that we saw for 2014. And we can talk about the fact that the Saudis and the GCC have this currency peg, so they don't have exchange rate flexibility. But, you know, the Russians do have, and they're certainly more diversified as well. I should also point that out. They're not as dependent on oil for government revenue. It's certainly a big part of their government revenue, but it's not primary dependent. They have a much bigger manufacturing sector. They have other industries. That said, they also have, we would say, significant security and foreign policy expenditures that don't necessarily make it into official budget numbers. And you can look, for example, at the expansion of their bases in a place like Syria over the past couple of years. That's not an official budgeting numbers, but that would be something that would contribute to a, a higher fiscal break even. Mm -hmm. So we actually think if you take the full spectrum of Russian military, security, arms activities, you know, again, put in things that they're doing in Crimea, Ukraine, Syria, their global footprint in terms of security, military expenditure, we think it pushes our break even, you know, into the 50s or low 60s. Again, it's a gray area number because a lot of this expenditure is off book. But again, we think that's why it's not a $42 number. Mm -hmm. And you also have a situation because of the Russian tax structure, windfall gains of higher oil prices, somebody does benefit from them. I'm always amazed when somebody says, well, they don't want higher oil prices because issues about the currency. I'm like, no, in a higher oil price environment, the windfall gains go to the state treasury, but they don't go necessarily to the companies because of the tax structure. So they have an incentive to increase volume. And so I think there's always been this sort of tension within the Russian energy sector between those who were looking at, well, what does the government coffer look like in a rising oil price environment from someone like the head of the Russian direct investment fund saying, well, what kind of deals can I do with cooperation mm -hmm. with OPEC? And then the individual companies who say, well, look at our tax structure. Why don't you give us tax relief if we're going to be forced to sit down production? And so I think that's the internal tension within the Russian energy sector that people don't always appreciate. You know, in the case of Saudi Arabia or another Gulf producer, it's a national oil company that dominates the sector. I think in Russia, because you have these companies, it's a different structure and there are tensions within the system. And the Russian oil minister, Putin's the final arbiter on everything in Russia, but there's mm -hmm. always this process of negotiation internally. What about other other countries in the region? We talk a lot about about Russia and Saudi, and you know, obviously, there was a terrible expo explosion in Lebanon uh, earlier this week that that killed so so many people and and wounded thousands more. How do the tensions in that region end up uh, overflowing into sort of the U.S. and uh, global oil markets, and like how how's that going to be impacted? Well, I think again, what's so interesting is if I, I think back to 2019, and we 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 did this year like this is the timeline of 2019 looking at, you know, starting when the U.S. decided to end exemptions from imported of Iranian oil in April. Mm -hmm. And you had Iranian officials out there basically saying, look, if we can't sell our oil, you know what? Nobody can. And I remember listening to Iranian officials saying, like, they're going to be planned accidents around, like, strategic waterways yeah. in the Gulf, like, basically giving us the roadmap for what we saw from May onwards when they started with those tanker attacks, attacks on the East West Pipeline. Because the Iranians have really been squeezed. I mean, if you think about like OPEC in general, I mean, there are numbers that talk about, if you look at like 2012, the total oil revenue for OPEC was like $1.3 trillion. 
you, you look at 2019, you know, that's around like 580 billion. And now you look at 2020, it's going to be potentially less than $350 billion. So again, wow. like 1.3 trillion collectively to potentially less than 350 billion. This is a huge revenue hit. And countries like Iran have been hit not just because of, you know, falling prices, you know, but also because they've been subject to such serious sanctions. I mean, Iran has lost, you know, probably over a million and a half of exports they can put on the market. So they're facing such a serious financial crisis because of lower oil prices and sanctions. And what we saw in 2019 was an effort to try to change facts on the ground through using their proxy groups and frankly, you know, their own asymmetric capabilities to try to hit out at the Gulf states that were backing this policy. And what was so interesting was it just didn't necessarily move the needle in terms of price. And so I think, you know, the question is, are we going to see more type of attacks from the Iranians? And they've been fairly quiet since the killing of Qasem Soleimani, the head of the IRGC, Revolutionary Guards Quds Force in January, which, again, people thought could be kicking off a, a third Gulf war. They've been relatively quiet since then. But it'll be interesting to see. We've had this summer a number of mysterious explosions in Iran. Like we've had the Natanz enrichment facility where they have their centrifuge program for their nuclear devices. Mm -hmm. There's a mysterious explosion of that facility in July. There was a mysterious explosion at the facility that they use to produce ballistic missiles. Some have said that the Israelis are behind these attacks trying to degrade the Iranian capabilities before U.S. election. And so there are all these things that are sort of going on under the radar that aren't moving the needle in terms of price. Again, because I think we have so much spare capacity out there. Demand is weak. And, you know, five years ago, if you had said the Natanz facility in Iran, where they have their centrifuges for the nuclear program, it's going to be a mysterious explosion that people think may have been a bomb. And the Israelis or an Israeli sponsored group in Iran may have done this. Prices would have been through the roof. Yeah. But again, now we don't really see a price response. And frankly, it's not really covered that aggressively in the media. And yeah. I, I, I say now what oil has become, like oil used to be a leading indicator of instability in the Middle East. Like I remember, you know, 10 years ago yeah. when you would just have like the whisper that you might have an Israeli attack on Iran and prices moving like mm -hmm. you know, five, you know, five dollars could move on that. And now you literally have a potential bomb attack on the main enrichment site and no one bats an eye. Yeah. And so to me, I think it's become a broken barometer, not a leading indicator. But that does not mean that there's not a lot of potential tension, that there could be a tripwire cross. Right. So if you ask me like what I'm telling people to be most focused on is really be focused on you know, what we're seeing in terms of these mysterious incidents. Now, Lebanon, it does look like that was just a horrific accident. And it's interesting because on, on Monday, you had had Israeli military strikes on militant targets right. in Syria after the Israelis had said that these groups were trying to like sneak across and plant explosives in the Golan Heights. Again, something yeah. that we would have really been focused on years ago. And now we're sort of like, oh, it's just, it's more noise. And so that's why I think there was this initial concern about Lebanon, but that looks like it was a terrible accident. But again, it came only days after these Syrian airstrikes. And on that Tuesday, you still had Netanyahu give this speech where he essentially said, like, we will vigorously defend ourselves. Nobody should basically doubt our resolve. And so I do think we want to be watching what's happening, this kind of shadow war. It seems like it's been happening between you know, Israel, Iran, Hezbollah in the region. And again, the market is not a leading indicator of the tension. It's a lagging indicator. And so I think that that's just something we need to really be very cognizant of, that it's not in any way stable in that region right now. Yeah, I think that's true for a lot of indicators around the market where we're seeing events that would have triggered a major market response, even just in you know major indexes. And we're not seeing we're not seeing that same connectivity 
uh, around volatility and market moves broadly. It's, it, it's interesting. I'm getting a few questions around the U.S. specifically and what to expect with the election. You know, what happens to U.S. domestic production if Biden wins the election? Or can you just talk a little bit about U.S. Yeah. politics? I think this is a great question. I think this is going to become a really increasingly relevant question because, you know, when you think about the the, the Biden climate task force and you have, you know, it's headed by, you know, John Kerry and then, you know, Congresswoman Alexandria Mm Ocasio-Cortez and then you have Congressman Connor Lamb from, you know, Pennsylvania, (laughs) you know, a big supporter of like, you know, the industry on that task force. And you say, well, what does the Biden plan really mean? And you see the the $2 trillion for clean energy, the climate plan, they're going to go back into Paris climate accord on day one. You know, they're talking about really strict limits on methane, you're trying to get to net zero. It's a very sort of renewables, clean energy focused plan. But then when you look at the traditional, you know, oil and gas sector, what it doesn't have in it, I think, is really important. It does not contain a ban on fracking. It does mm-hmm. not contain a ban on U.S. exports. They're talking about sort of no new leases on federal property, you know, no, you know, keeping the Arctic and wildlife, you know, sort of zoning that off. But it's not a whole scale assault on oil and gas. You know, that said, when you talk to people around the campaign, they will say that you have to now separate oil and gas, that it will be a more gas friendly policy likely because gas is viewed as the really important bridge fuel in a clean energy transition. Like if you're going to displace coal, you need natural gas. And if you're very focused on coal displacement in India and in China, you need natural gas. And so when we want to think about sort of pipeline permitting, it's going to be potentially more favorable for gas. So of, you know, the oil and gas sectors, we potentially see it more heavily focused and supportive of gas because gas is seen as so important to achieving global climate goals. But where I think is really interesting in terms of physical markets, and I always say to investors, like to me, if you're looking at the physical market, supply and demand, probably the most consequential near-term decision that could differentiate President Trump and a potential President Biden would be on Iran. Like right now, the Trump administration is sticking with the maximum pressure policy on Iran and continuing with efforts to really try to squeeze the regime financially and doing things like trying to get the UN to extend the embargo on arms purchases for Iran. So again, everything remains quite punitive on Iran. The real contrast, I think, with the administration is they're talking about not just going back into the climate agreement, the Paris climate agreement, they're also talking about re-entering the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action nuclear deal from 2015. That was seen as one of the principal foreign policy achievements of the Obama-Biden administration. And so I think that they are very serious about trying to resurrect that agreement. And when you have potentially between 1.5 and 2 million barrels of Iranian oil exports that are off the market because of sanctions, and we have a weak demand outlook, certainly better than the catastrophe that was April, but still a fragile demand picture and a market that's really being propped up by, you know, frankly, Chinese buying at this moment. If we were to get an additional million, million and a half barrels of Iranian oil exports on the market, you know, that is, a, I would say, for oil prices, that's a potentially very bearish outcome. And then potentially we think about any relaxation on sanctions on Venezuela, we could get more Venezuelan barrels back on the market. Again, the market does not need those additional barrels right now on the water. And I think that is probably just in terms of balance that the most consequential difference would be near term would be JCPOA. And I think there's certainly things that the Iranians would have to do. They've made breaches of the agreement since the U.S. withdrew. So they are enriching uranium at higher levels. They are spinning some of the centrifuge devices that they were not supposed to be spinning, the high speed centrifuges. They are sort of restarting work in facilities that were supposed to be sort of mothballed under the 2015 agreement. But 
none of those breaches are seen as irreversible. And mm -hmm. so it's seen that Iran could relatively quickly become compliant with the agreement again if the U.S. reentered. And the mechanism for providing sanctioned relief on energy looks fairly straightforward in terms of the United States simply issuing exemptions for importers to import Iranian barrels. So again, I think there is a real chance under a Biden administration that you could be talking about by end of 2021, significant return of Iranian barrels. Again, in a still fragile demand picture for oil. So you talked about Venezuela. What, what is the, you know, what's the capacity for barrels coming back online in the future? And, and so it does sound as if that is tied to our election to some extent, based on how you just described it. Yeah, and I certainly think, you know, what's so interesting is in the case of Iran, we say it's not a regime change policy. We simply want them to moderate their behavior in the region. We want to end their nuclear ambition. But like publicly, we say it's not a regime change policy. I think mm -hmm. the audience are looking at it saying, no, it's, it's a regime change policy. But what's so interesting is if you look at the contrast with Venezuela, like we explicitly do have a regime change policy. Like the United States government really recognizes Juan Guaido as the official head of Venezuela. Yeah. We have, you know, yeah. there is a Juan Guaido appointee as the ambassador in Washington that is not the Maduro ambassador that we have as our key interlocutor, that we have recognized. We have really, you know, stepped up our efforts to squeeze that regime, starting with our, you know, embargo on, you know, Venezuelan barrels coming into the United States. I mean, we had been taking about 500,000 Venezuelan barrels into our Gulf Coast refineries. Like we put a blanket embargo on those barrels coming into the United States. And we've made it more challenging for, th you know, for Venezuela to be able to service its debt, for, you know, foreign companies to do business with Venezuela, leaving them very dependent on the Russian lifeline and to a certain extent, the Chinese lifeline. It'll be interesting to see if you have a Biden administration, would we start relaxing some of those restrictions? But I think the difference with Venezuela and with Iran is that Venezuela is a crisis that is like multi-decade in the making. I talked about like being at the CIA, going into the Iraq war. We had all these problems in Nigeria that we were concerned about. And as I said, we were very concerned about the Venezuelan oil strike, where we had lost like a million barrels plus of Venezuelan production because of this strike by employees of the national oil company, PDVSA, which at the time was one of the best run national oil companies in the world. And what Hugo Chavez did after that strike, I think would fundamentally change the trajectory of Venezuelan production. They fired thousands of PDVSA employees who had taken part in that strike. They'd taken a jewel of an organization and turned it into a vehicle for the state. It became a piggy bank for the state. And so I think it's been a collapsing industry since 2003. And it has certainly gotten much worse. The speed of the collapse has accelerated. But I mean, Venezuela, you almost want to think about it as a post-conflict situation if we get a new regime. Like millions of people have left Venezuela. It is one of the world's largest mass migrations in human history. You look at all the economic indicators in terms of poverty rates, in terms of, you know, extraordinary inflation, yeah. shortages of food. I mean, diseases that have been eradicated are now virulent in Venezuela. And so the type of reconstruction assistance that's going to need to be provided and need just to get the country back up on its feet. And then when you want to think about oil production, I mean, to basically get the companies to feel comfortable operating there. I'm, I've been in these meetings where you literally have oil company officials say, do you know how many arms are in circulation in Venezuela? How many sort of the paramilitary groups are making the environment just so unsafe. Like we almost need a DDR program. And so companies are going to need to pour billions of dollars in investment back into that energy sector there. So I think that Venezuela removing some of the sanctions can help with getting some of the low hanging fruit in terms of production and exports back online. But the recovery of this sector on any meaningful scale is going to require a coordinated action of the international community will be likely led by you know, the IMF and World Bank, but it's gonna need significant participation from Western powers to like rebuild this country.
So I'm going to turn to another question that I that I received here. So with the growing globalization of the natural gas market, which you've touched on a little bit, do you think the formation of an OPEC type organization for natural gas is a realistic possibility? Well, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, they have this big gas producers association led by the former head of Gazprom. You know, I don't think yet we are going to get like a sort of a a OPEC arrangement for gas. Um, mm -hmm. There's just some obstacles to getting that done. But I think what's really interesting is I think the geopolitics they talk about, if we had an incoming Biden administration, I think the emphasis would be more on gas. I do think the geopolitics of gas are becoming you know, increasingly interesting. And again, I think when we think about like the efforts that the U.S. is now redeploying to sort of blocking Nord Stream 2, which is putting us at odds with our, you know, some of our key European allies, like the Germans, who are essentially saying, like, wait a second, what are you doing trying to block our ability to purchase Russian gas? Like, this is the most economic gas for us. Why, why are you trying to get involved in the middle of a contractual relationship between, you know, Russia and Germany? and Russia and key you know, European importing nations. And so what I think is going to be interesting to think about is, you know, if you get a Biden administration or a second term Trump administration, are we going to continue these efforts to really try to force Europe to find non-Russian sources of gas? And that leads to the sort of discussion amongst consuming countries and frankly, other gas producers who are not happy with the U.S. policy saying, we see sanctions as simply a way to allow U.S. companies to gain market share. And this is like, mm -hmm. I, I've literally been in these conversations where you've had sort of you know, Indian officials, you know, in the Modi government, that Modi is very close to the United States, still talking about sanctions as a way for you. They believe it's a way that the U.S. is trying to get market share for their companies. And so I think that, you know, in the sort of energy transition where gas plays an important role, I think these whole discussions about, you know, energy access, about sanctions, the whole geopolitics of gas are going to become increasingly important. It's almost like a movie when you think about all the different players coming in and, and so much so much is happening all in, in such a short period of time you know, over the past several months. And it's hard to predict the future. I certainly don't think that anyone would have started this year and, you know, we going back to our the beginning of our conversation when you talked about in January what we were seeing just over the next few months is really fascinating. Right. I mean, I think what's so interesting is like I started the year. I'm at my house in Rhode Island now because we've been <laughs> out of the city since that. You know, the the pandemic really started having shut-ins in March. But I started the year here getting woken up because we had basically killed Qasem Soleimani again, the head of the Iranian Revolution <laughs> Guards right. Force, in this incredible strike. And people thought, oh, my gosh, you know, he was so important. It's almost in, over, impossible to overstate how important he was to the Iranian security services. Like almost every spectacular Iranian overseas action, he played a role. And he's like the Kaiser Soze of Iran. And to have him killed by U.S. action, like we really thought we were potentially going into a yes. third Gulf War. And the fact that now, like no one really cares about what we're seeing in the Middle East. I mean, I think that just shows how the pandemic has totally altered our market expectations. That this is, you know, this is something where, mm -hmm. you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the Middle East and the other parts of this sort of fragile producer universe. But right now it's not capturing our attention. Well, sticking with the Middle East, I'm going to go to another question that we got here. Libya's oil facilities have been at the heart of its conflict with different groups repeatedly closing them. What do you see for its future? And will they continue to leverage their oil production in this civil unrest? Well, this is such a, a great question as well, because I think about the, the Arab Spring in 2011. And, you know, Libya was one of the, the primary casualties of the Arab Spring. And I remember initially, remember we talked about like people in the streets of Tahrir Square and the Arab Spring initially looked like, you know, a colored revolution. It looked like, yeah. you know, people were comparing it to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89. And they were saying, you know, these young people yeah. in the streets demanding better governments, democracy. And we saw these autocratic regimes fall in Tunisia and Egypt. And people thought through the lens of something very optimistic initially. And then it came into civil unrest and it became protracted conflict. And again, we talked about Syria now, but really Libya, I think, is where it turned into the Arab winter. And Libya has seen nothing but sort of unrest and misery since the fall of Gaddafi. 
And oil production has really been a casualty of this conflict. I mean, pre-Arab Spring, they were producing around, you know, 1.7 million barrels a day. You know, now they're down to a couple hundred thousand. And production has varied wildly. But what has become really worrying about the Libyan conflict, and my, my primary takeaway for your audience would be, it's become so internationalized that this is no longer a situation where the outcome of Libya depends on what the internal actors do. It is now about what the foreign sponsors basically decide on. And you have this situation now where you have, you know, one group of actors being supported by a coalition that includes you know, the Russians, the mm -hmm. Gulf states like Saudi Arabia, UAE, and then you have and the Egyptians, you know, really big sponsor of General Haftar. And then on the other side, you have the sort of UN backed government that is also being strongly supported by Turkey, by countries like Qatar. And so it's becoming very much a sort of theater where these external actors are settling scores and trying to secure resources. We talk about Russia. There's a significant Russian mercenary presence in there by a group called the, the Wagner Group. And people have said the Wagner Group, it's not formal Russian security services, but they're more tied to oligarchs and they're very focused on securing natural resources. And so you have like all these foreign actors piling in. And that just makes a settlement of Libya ever more challenging. And it, it's become, it's just become such a horrific tragedy in terms of the sort of, you know, there was this moment when people were talking about Libya before the Arab Spring about sort of basically U.S. sanctions had been removed. They were becoming a more normal part of the kind of international order. And Libya now is just a, it's a failed state. So we're running out of time. And uh, just to recap a bit and, and focus on what's the one thing you think people should be focused on? What should they be looking at for? What, where should they be keeping their keeping their eye out? I mean, again, in terms of oil markets, in terms of the geopolitical oil markets, I think elections matter. And I think, again, as we talked about, I think, you know, in a weak demand picture with a fragile recovery, we don't need additional barrels on the market if you want a, a better oil price. And so I do think that you know, the pace at which Iranian barrels might return could be very impactful for the oil market. And then, as I said, the other sort of election story to watch is, you know, if it is a Biden administration, mm -hmm. could it be much more focused on gas as opposed to oil? And then again, the Middle East as well, things that go bump in the night, pay attention to the <laughs> mysterious explosions that we've seen in places like Iran. Well, Halima, thank you so much for, for unpacking all this information and helping to make sense of it. There are a lot of moving, a lot of moving parts and a lot of players in the, in the oil markets and gas markets. And it's really helpful to have you out there putting it all together and, and making sense of it for us so that we can be, be better informed and manage our risk. Thank you so much for having me on. It was such a huge honor. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Linda. Have a great, have a great weekend. Thanks again to Halima Croft, managing director and global head of commodity strategy at RBC Capital Markets and our own NYSC President Stacey Cunningham doing the work of asking the questions. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Pete Ash with production assistance from Ken Abel and Ian Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 